Well, uh, I'm going to uh, get back on our series called The Fundamentals of Faith. And uh, we took a break for about three weeks from that and talking to you about getting ready for the move of God, preparing ourselves. I'm telling you, I expect any time for the winds of God to blow through this place. I'm telling you, I'm expecting any time for unusual manifestation Amen. of the Holy Ghost to occur. You got to, and, and I'm encouraging all of you that are, uh, are prayers, I want you to keep praying toward that end. Expecting the move of God. I want a revival. God wants to visit the earth. Amen? And when God visits the earth with that last great visitation of His Spirit, I want Faith Family Church to be one of those places where the Holy Ghost falls. Amen? Hallelujah. Well, I'm going to give you about 10 or 11 points today because I want everybody called up. I want everybody on the same page. Those of you that are watching online, you might want to take some notes, okay? Because I want to get everybody on the same page. I'm telling you, the life that we live is a wonderful life. Amen. I'm talking about as a born-again, Holy Ghost-filled child of God. Lord. As I was sitting there worshiping, the Lord reminded me when Peter was in prison. Now, you'd think being in prison, he'd be thinking about, poor me, you know, I can't believe this happened to me. I've done the best I could. That's the way most Christians act when things don't go the way they want them to go. But you know what Peter's doing? Peter, he's praying. He's praising him and Paul and all them guys. They knew what to do when things weren't going the way they seemed like it should be going. The angel of the Lord just, you know, touched him and all the chains came off and the prison, you know, doors just opened up by the power of God. And the angel said, now go stand at the temple and declare the words of this life. The words of this life. This God life, this Holy Ghost life. Folks, I'm telling you, it's a supernatural life. Amen. You ought to be living super, a supernatural life. And a lot of people I know, are they're into these ministers that are always whining and crying and make you feel better about yourself. You know, I was in a meeting. For, I want to give you an example of what I'm talking about. I was in a meeting, and I had, uh, the, and God told me, it was a minister's conference, and there's three or four hundred ministers there and their families. And I mean, it's a big meeting. And I'm praying and seeking the Lord because I've been asked to speak. And, I, and the Lord said, I want you to preach about supernatural increase of finances. And I said, Lord, please let me preach something else. I even gave him several ideas. I did. I said, Lord, let me preach about the manifested sons of God. They need to hear this. He said, no. I said, Lord, let me preach about the glory of God. He said, no. I want you to preach this message. And while I'm preaching that message, you know, this came out of my mouth. I had never said this before. I said the reason that a lot of preachers, listen to me, that a lot of preachers won't preach this message about financial increase, I said, you know, they're afraid of what everybody's going to think. And, you know, I said, here's the thing. If, if, you're, if you don't preach it, what you're doing, you're keeping your people at a place where they're comfortable. I said, preachers that won't preach prosperity, they're just keeping their people in a comfortable place. Because when you start preaching something that they haven't learned and walked in, it makes them uncomfortable. Amen? How many of you remember the first time you was in a service where somebody preached about the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Huh? Did it make you a little bit uncomfortable? Folks, there's a lot of things that's in the Word of God that will make you uncomfortable, that'll get you out of your comfort zone, yeah. right? Now here, I want y'all to understand that the life that we're living is not a life where you're supposed to be walking about, whining about how bad everything is, how hard it is, and what you've been through. Remember what we talked to, the, the minister talked about Sunday morning? And Wednesday night, I brought it up again, and somebody wasn't, some of you wasn't here. But I asked Wednesday night, have any of you visited the basement lately? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. He talked about, he gave that analogy of people who just live in the past. Yeah. It's like living down in the basement where it's dark and cold and danky and spiders and all that kind of stuff. And he said, you don't invite friends to go down into the basement when they come to your house. You bring them in where you live, into the present, the living room, right? Yeah. But there's a lot of people, that's all they talk about is their past, how hard it's been. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know what happened to me. You don't know how bad I was hurt. I've been through three divorces, and I was abused when I was a child. And you know what, folks? I don't make light of none of that. 
But here's the thing. When you get washed in the blood of Jesus, when you're born again, you receive the life of God. He that hath the Son has life. This is the very life of God that abides on the inside of us. And you ought to be a, one of those people that's shouting, I've got too much of the life of God in me to be sick. i got too much of the life of God in me to be defeated. i got too much of the life of God in me to be depressed. Amen. Amen. Say it out loud. I'm born, I'm born again. Because I believe, because I believe that Jesus Christ died for my sins. I believe with all my heart that he rose from the dead, that he's alive. He's alive. I have confessed. And I do confess that he's my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, I've got the life of God in me. Hallelujah. I don't understand these mealy mouth preachers that haven't got anything to say but get up and read a poem or two. Brother Milt was telling me about a man that preaches 15 minutes. 15 minutes? I can't even give my introduction in 15 minutes. That's what I'm working on right now, my introduction. <laughs> Why? Because, listen to me, folks, what God has done in my life, he wants to do in every person's life. Let me back up. What God did in Jesus' life, he wants to do in every man's life. Are you listening to what I'm saying to you? All right. Now, do y'all remember when I started this series, this is part fit, six, the fundamentals of faith. And I told you about Vince Lombardi, greatest coach probably ever been. He started every season with a football. He said, gentlemen, this is the football. He started with the basics. People, this is the word of faith. Paul said, this is what I preach, the word of faith. Peter preached the word of faith. Jesus preached the word of faith. I am preaching to you the word of faith, and it will cause faith to be produced in your heart. Amen? Number one, first point this morning, write it down. God wants you to win. Say it out loud. God wants me to win. Listen to this, 1 Corinthians 15, 57. It says, but thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I want you to say it out loud. Thanks be to God, be to God. Who, gives the who gives me the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus. Now, I noticed something I never noticed before as I was studying this. That was in the first letter that he wrote to the church in Corinth. And undoubtedly, somebody must have read that and said, well, surely, Paul, we don't win every time. Surely God doesn't want us to win every time. So he corrected it when he wrote the second letter to him, and he said in 2 Corinthians 2.14, Now thanks be unto God, which always, somebody say always, always, always causes us to triumph in Christ. Amen. Amen. I'm telling you, you're a child of God. You ought to have a triumphant attitude about you. You ought to have a winner's attitude at all times. Amen. You ought to be walking around saying, I cannot be defeated. I cannot be defeated because I walk as Jesus walked. I talk as Jesus talked. I live the way Jesus lived. And as he is, so am I in this world right now. I've been made righteous through the blood of Jesus. I'm more than a conqueror to him that loved me and gave himself for me. Therefore, I cannot be defeated. Listen to me, saint. The only way the devil can defeat you is to get you to agree with him. That's the reason those words should never come out of your mouth. I'm sick. I'm depressed. I'm worried. I'm afraid. That's exactly what the devil wants you to do. Because whether you realize it or not, when you said those things, you just gave place to the devil. And the Bible says give no place to him. Don't give him an inch, a half inch. Don't give him an eighth or a sixteenth of an inch. Don't give him one thirty-second, one sixty-fourth. Are you with me now? No place whatsoever. Hallelujah. Number two. Y'all ready? God's will is not automatic. God's will is not automatic. The Bible says it is the will of God that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It is the will of God for everybody to get saved. Is the will of God automatic? Does everybody get saved automatically? No, why? Because we got a part. We've got to believe in our heart and confess with our mouth, Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. He will for you to be saved or to be healed, to be filled with the Holy Ghost, to be delivered, to have a good marriage. Listen to me. All the things that you desire, 
that is God's will, according to this word, none of them are automatic. You are not going to have a marriage made in heaven automatically just because you married that man or woman. And I think most of you have found that out. <laughs> Amen? Because I'm telling you right now, there's going to be problems. There's going to be tests. There's going to be trials. But that doesn't mean you have to fail the test. Right? I mean, God is surely he, he's better than those teachers we had in our school where you would fail a test. They said, well, I'm going to give you another chance said, and, re, and retest you. <laughs> Are you going to be retested over and over and over until you pass? Because God's going to do everything he can to help you to pass. Right. Amen? He wants you to be a winner, and he wants you to understand that his will is not automatic. Listen to me. I have said this over and over through the last many years. A lot of people think that Christianity is a case of rah, rah religion. Whatever will be, will be. They think, well, if it's God's will, it's going to happen. If it's not God's will, it's not going to happen. Somebody gets killed, uh, you'll hear preachers, you hear Christians say, well, it's the will of God or it wouldn't happen. You know, God just needed another flower for his garden. Give me a religious break. <laughs> Come on, people. First of all, he's got plenty of go uh, flowers already. Well, he just, you know, they became an angel. No, men that die do not become angels. It is a whole different part of creation. Somebody who loved you and died, they are not watching over you as far as angels. They are on the bandstands of heaven. Pastor Adam talked about this later, uh, not long ago. They're cheering you on. Amen? They want you to make it. It's no different than you've got a kid out there uh, running a race, and you're on the sideline, and you're just cheering them on. Run, go, go, go. That's what they're doing. But they're not angels. They don't have wings. Amen? And they cannot pass back to this side. You're with me so far. Number three, I said God's will is not automatic. However, number three, there's nothing impossible for God, and nothing is impossible to those that believe. Absolutely nothing too hard for God. I want you to think about what is the most critical thing in your life right now. What do you need more than anything else? Do you need a sound mind? Do you need a sound body, healing in your body? Do you need God to help you in your marriage? Do you need financial help? Are they about to cut your water off and your power off? Listen, there's nothing too hard for God. And all things are possible to those that believe. I want you to say it out loud. Hold one hand up. I want to get everybody's attention. Hold one hand up. Say it from your heart. I'm a believer. Not a, not a doubter. I walk by faith, walk by faith. And, not by and not by sight. I'm not moved, I'm not moved. By, what by what I see, by what I hear, by what I feel, or by the circumstances of life. I am moved by the Word of God and by the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. God wants you to know that there is nothing too hard for him, but it's not a matter of what he can do. It's a matter of what you can believe. And you believe with your heart, and you confess with your mouth. If you don't do both of those things, listen to me. A lot of times people will say, well, I do believe in my heart, and I'll say, well, you're halfway there. You're halfway towards your miracle. When you believe in your heart that Jesus died for your sin and rose from the dead, you're halfway there. You know, I remember Brother Hagin, my spiritual father, telling that he was at a, he had been invited to a great big conference, full gospel business fellowship, what it was, and he said, the leader of the, the, the group told him, he said, uh, there's a man that attends these meetings. They said he's very faithful. He goes to church. He's one of the hardest workers in the church. One of the best people he ever met. And Brother Hagin said, well, what's the problem? He said, you've never been born again. Well, why not? He said, well, he believes that Jesus died for a sin. He believes. He said, but for some reason, he said, he just can't seem to get over that, that hump. Something holding him back. That he, he wants to be saved. He's been praying for months and months and months. He goes to the altar. He'll cry. He'll call on God. And he said, but he's still not saved. Oh, Brother Hagin said, that's no problem at all. I can help him. So during those meetings, one day, and they had pointed the man out to him, so he knew who he was. And so one day, uh, he started talking about the confession of faith. 
the confession of faith. Then we may get to it today, we may not, but I'm going to go ahead and say this to you right now. He said, so one day I was asking for testimonies, and people were getting up and they were testifying, and he said, uh, he pointed at that man, he said, you brother, he said, stand up and confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And the man was very uncomfortable at this moment. And he said, well, I, I just don't feel like I can do that. Right in front of everybody. Brother Hagin said, said, all you got to do is just stand up and say it. He said, just confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. He said, I can't do that. He said, why not? He said, because I'm not saved. He said, I know you're not saved. I'm trying to help you. He said, do you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sin? He said, yes, I do. He said, do you believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead? Yes, I do. Do you believe that Jesus is alive and he's here now? He said, yes, I do. He said, then stand up and say, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. The man was humiliated. He was embarrassed, but he just stood up real quickly and he said, I confess Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And he sat back down. <laughs> that night in the service, as soon as the guy started, the man jumped up and said, can I say something? Brother Hagin said, go ahead. He said, well, everybody saw what happened this morning. He said, it was very awkward to me, very strange, very embarrassing. He said, but I want you to know when I said Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, something happened on the inside. And he said, and I am born again. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Isn't God good? So all things are possible to him that what? To everybody that has faith. There's nothing too hard, nothing impossible. If you have faith in God. Yeah, but what about what the doctor said? What about what everybody else is saying? What about it? Let God be true and every man a liar. If it doesn't agree with God, listen to me, cast it down. Every thought that comes to your mind, cast it down. If it doesn't agree with God's word. Because thoughts can come from the devil. Thoughts can come from your past. And you've got to learn to cast those things down Get out of the den, amen? Come into the present and make a plan for your future. Amen. Hallelujah. Number four, having faith in God is being fully persuaded of what God says and his ability to perform it. Having faith in God is being fully persuaded of what God says and his ability to perform it. Anything that you need change in your life, I want you to find scriptures for it. I want you to find Bible verses. I want you to get the chapter, the verses, and I want you to write them down. I want you to personalize them. I want you to put your name in there. And I want you to say it out loud over and over and over because I'm telling you right now, the confession of faith creates reality in your life. Anything that you confess by faith that you believe in your heart will become reality in your life. Amen. You can be dying with cancer, and I'm telling you right now, I, no matter what the doctor says, no matter what the tests are showing, if you believe in your heart and you begin to say, himself took my infirmities, himself bear my sicknesses, by his stripes I was healed, by his stripes I am healed, a healing and a cure is working in my body. Amen. By the stripes of Jesus, I was healed. I've got too much of the life of God in me to allow cancer to stay. Amen? Well, pastor, it runs in my family. What have I told y'all about that? Run it out in Jesus' name. Drive it out in Jesus' name. Use that weapon of your warfare, the name of Jesus, because all the power of Jesus is in his name, and that name has been given to you. Don't allow the devil to run, run over you. Amen? Listen to me carefully now. You've got to believe God's word. You've got to believe, be fully persuaded of what God says and his ability to perform it. Number five, faith is not believing what you see. It's seeing what you believe. Faith is not believing what you see. It's seeing what you believe. In other words, you've got to see yourself with the promise. You've got to see yourself with what you prayed for before there's any physical proof of it whatsoever. Before there's any physical manifestation. You've got to see yourself with that promise. You've got to see yourself healed. You've got to see yourself free, delivered. You've got to see yourself victorious. Amen? 
you got to see yourself living a better life because of the Lord Jesus Christ, his finished work and the promises of God. Number six, faith begins where the will of God is known. I want you to say it out loud with me. Faith begins where the will of God is known. Say it again. Faith begins where the will of God is known. Well, if faith begins where the will of God is known, then faith stops where the will of God is not known. That's the reason God said to the prophet, he said, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. When Paul said fight the good fight of faith, he said it because there's enemies, there's hindrances to your faith. And one of the greatest hindrances, one of the greatest enemies to your faith is a lack of knowledge. You wouldn't believe the time I've been talking to people and telling them what the Bible says, and they say, well, I didn't know that. I tell my people have been saved for years and years. Well, I didn't know that. That's a lack of knowledge. Why do you think the Bible says to study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth? Faith always begins where the will of God is known. You cannot pray the prayer of faith if you don't know it's God's will for you to have what you're about to ask for. If someone comes down to this altar this morning, and wants healing in their body, the first thing I want to know is, do you believe that it's God's will for you to be healed, for you to receive your healing? Because that's where your faith begins. I know it's God's will to heal every person every time. Just like it's God's will to save every lost sinner every single time. Amen? Listen, James 5.15 says, The prayer of faith will save the sick. The prayer of faith will save the sick. Clean it. So. Now listen, I want to tell you all, many, many, many years ago, first church I pastored, a Baptist church, I was preaching healing. I worked with a, a, a young guy that had gotten saved named Ricky. He and Brenda, his wife, had just had a baby. And uh, so I told them that uh, this child, I don't even remember how old the child was, only a few weeks old. And, uh, but the baby would cry, and the tear ducts were stopped up so that there would be no tears. And so he was telling me at work one day that they had, to, had scheduled surgery for this, this baby. And I said, bring that baby to church Sunday morning. And I had to drive about 50, 60 miles to get there. I said, bring that church, baby to church Sunday morning. I'll pray for her. She'll be healed. And sure enough, they showed up. You know, it takes faith for Baptists to drive an hour to go to church. <laughs> I'm talking about anybody. It takes faith for anybody. You've got to be expanded. I don't care what you call yourself. Pentecostal, Catholic, anything else. Right? Amen? But now listen to me. At the end of the service, they come down. I laid hands on that child, prayed, and before they left, she started crying. Tears were running down her face. Never had the surgery. Never had the surgery whatsoever. The Bible says the prayer of faith will save the sick. Now, I can't remember exactly how it happened. But I do remember Brother J.D. Raise your hand, J.D. Everybody doesn't know you yet. Everybody look. Now, listen. Brother J.D. showed up here one day. Is it all if I share a little bit of your testimony, J.D.? Because he's been telling everybody anyway. <laughs> J.D. showed up here one Sunday morning. And I believe you got, didn't you get born again that Sunday morning? That first Sunday morning. The next morning, early on Monday morning, the Lord spoke to me to go to find him and give me $20. So I had to call around find out where he lived, which was not, he wasn't living that far from here. And so I went over there. He come out. He had his hand on the side. I can still see it. He's in pain. And I asked him what's wrong. He didn't really know, but he's just in a lot of pain. I said, well, the Lord told me to give you this $20, and I'll be praying for you. And so I did. And I asked the Lord to bless him and help him or whatever, you know, and, let, and, and I gave him that $20. So later in the afternoon, Allie and I was in Florence, and uh, the person that actually, I believe it was Jamie, was it Jamie that invited you? Y'all cousins, aren't you? And, uh, and so he called me and said, uh, J.D. wanted me to let you, uh, let you know, thank you for the, the money, and let you know what happened. As soon as I left, J.D., he didn't have any gas, had no money, he was in pain all night long. As soon as I left, he jumped in the car, went to the country store, got enough gas to go to Lancaster Hospital. They immediately called the chopper from Charlotte, right? The helicopter came and got you? 
and told him if he had not got there when he did, he would have been dead within 24 hours because of something that had happened five years or so previously. He had been in a wreck, and he was, you know, in the hospital for a long time. He crushed his backbone. They had opened him up, took all that out, rebuilt his backbone out of metal. That metal had got infected. And so now he had an infection in his body that's going all through his body that would have killed him very soon. And so they had to open him up, clean him out, and, and put him, sew him back up. I think they put you in a body cast or something. Well, I sent word, and I said, tell him to get somebody to bring him. I don't care if you have to put him in the back seat, in the back of a pickup truck or whatever. Tell somebody to bring him, and I'm going to pray for him, and God will heal him. Amen. Well, sure enough, he came, and we laid hands on him, and guess what? He was doing so much better, so was it long before he went back up to that doctor, and they run tests. And that doctor told him, he thought it was wrong x-rays to start with, but then the doctor told him, he said, J.D., I don't know what happened to you, but you got a better back don't, backbone than I have, and you don't need any surgery whatsoever. Amen. Listen to me, the prayer of faith will save the sick. Amen. Now, at the time, because he didn't know a whole lot about the Word of God, God honored my faith. But what I want y'all to understand is, once you're born again, and you've been in the Bible, you've been in the Word of God, you've been in the church hearing the, the Word of faith talk, God will honor your faith. God will honor your faith for you to receive healing or to pray for somebody else now to receive their healing. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So faith begins where the will of God is known. Number seven. I want you to know there's two kinds of faith the Bible tells about. One we're going to call the Thomas kind of faith, and the other one's the Abraham kind of faith. You know, Thomas was that disciple who was not present after Jesus had rose from the dead and appeared to the other eleven. And they told Thomas, the Lord appeared to us. And Thomas said, I won't believe it unless I see it. Until I see the print of the nails in his hands, and I touch with my finger the print of those nails, and I thrust my hand into his side where the sword was, I will not believe it. i got to see it first. That's the Thomas kind of faith. How many you know that's not the God kind of faith? Abraham had the God kind of faith, right? Now, Jesus, 11 days later, or 8 days later, appeared to them again. This time, Thomas was there. And so, he said to Thomas, reach out your finger, see my hand. Be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet, everybody say yet. Yet, how believe? In other words, when you pray, believe you receive. If you need healing for your body this morning, you come down. If you need deliverance from addictions, you come down. Whatever it is you're needing help from God for, when you come, know that it's God's will for you to have it. As soon as I lay my hands on you, believe you receive it. Go home thanking God that you got it, right? Because you believe, yet, not even seeing anything or feeling anything yet. How many you know it's not over till it's good? Amen. Amen? Glory to God. Now, all of you remember Mary, the mother of Jesus. She had that same kind of faith. Remember when the angel told her that she was going to give birth to the Son of God and she was a virgin? Well, how can this be? Sin, I've never known a man. He said, the Holy Ghost is going to come upon you. The Holy Ghost is going to overshadow you. And that which is conceived of you shall be the Son of God. You know what this woman said to him? Now, here her, was her response. Be it unto me according to your word. Go ahead, Lord. Amen. I believe it. I receive it. I call it done. I've got it. Now, it wasn't long after that she went to visit her cousin Elizabeth, who was already six months pregnant with John the Baptist. See, John the Baptist and Jesus were cousins in the natural. When she told Elizabeth what happened, listen to this. The Bible says in Luke chapter 1, verses 44 to 45, as soon as the voice, this is Elizabeth saying this, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Hallelujah. Man, there ought to be something jumping around on the inside of you right now. 
You need salvation. You need healing. You need deliverance. You need help with anything. I'm telling you, the words of, uh, of faith of this message this morning ought to be stirring something on the inside of you. You ought to be conceiving something on the inside of you right now. And a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. There shall be a performance of those things. If God said it, you better believe it. I'm telling you, if God said it, believe it, receive it, there will be a performance of it. And you've got to start thanking him. Amen? You've got to start thanking him. You say, well, I need a job. Well, here's what you do. You say, Father, I come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You said a man that doesn't work, he doesn't eat, and I believe you want me to have a good job, and this is the kind of job I want. And you tell him what you're looking for and what you're wanting and what you're wanting to make. And you say, now, I believe I receive it and I thank you for it. And now listen to me. I'm not saying go home and sit down on the couch. Yeah, you've got to put in an application and you've got to start moving. God cannot direct anything that's not moving. It's like the old rack and pinion cars we used to drive when I was a boy. That thing had to be moving even turn the wheel. You couldn't steer it unless it was moving. All right? And God can't direct anybody who's not moving. And while you're moving, the Holy Ghost will direct you to the right place. And while you're moving, you're thanking God. I got it. I got it. It's mine. I've got that job in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I may not know exactly where it's at yet. Amen. I may not know exactly what I'm going to be doing yet, but I got the job in Jesus' name. That's how you walk by faith and live by faith. Amen. Glory to God. Number eight. Faith is acting like the Bible is true. I don't know if you can find a better definition than that. Faith is acting like the Bible's true. Faith says, God said it, it's true, I believe it, I'm going to act like it. What does that mean? Well, you read, for example, uh, I cannot think of a greater problem in America right now than financial problems. Any congregation that I go into, and I've done this before, I can say, how many of you are experiencing a spiritual problem? A few hands go up. How many of you are experiencing a physical problem? More hands go up. How many of you are experiencing financial problems? Lots of hands go up. Always. Every time they outnumber everything else. Financial problems. Well, the reason that so many of God's people are having financial problems, they say they believe the Bible, but they don't act like it. You say, what do you mean? The Bible says in Malachi 3.10, bring all the tithes and the offerings and to the storehouse. Test me. Prove me. See if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out blessings upon you more than you're able to receive it all. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Now, if you really believe, if you really had faith, when you read that, you would act like it's true and you would begin to tithe and you would begin to bring offerings because you know that God is not a man that he should lie. You know that God watches over his word to perform it. Has he said it? Shall he not do it? Yes. Amen. Lord. Hallelujah. Yes. Now, how many of you know somebody that if they told you something that you would believe every word of it and act just like you believed it's true? Do you know anybody like that? How many of you know somebody? If they tell you something, you can bank on it. Raise your hand if you know somebody like that. Yes. We all know somebody like that. And if they don't, and I've used Ralph for example, if Ralph told me, meet me in the morning at Bojangles at 8 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to give you $1,000. Well, I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to be there a few minutes before <laughs> 8. I promise you that. <laughs> and if Ralph don't show up at 8 o'clock, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to be looking because something has happened. He's had a flat tire, he's had a breakdown, something has happened. Why? Because he's a faithful man. I know that I can count on him. He's going to do exactly what he said he'd do. Our God is more faithful than anybody you've ever known. And if God said he'll do it, listen to me, he will do exactly what he said he'd do. But you've got to do your part. What do you mean? Bring the tithe. That means when you get paid, whenever you get paid, you sit down with your calculator or whatever you need to do, and you figure out what 10% is, you set it aside, and when you walk in this house, you say, Father God, your word says. See, God said, put me in remembrance. Real, true biblical prayer is praying God's word back to him. You said, bring the tithe. You said you would open the windows of heaven. And besides that time, Lord, I'm sowing seed. I'm bringing an offering. 
for the building fund, for the mission project. And you said, Lord, give and it shall be given unto you. Pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give it to your bosom. Therefore, Lord, I expect it. God wants you to have that kind of boldness. That you put him in remembrance of what he said, of what he promised. Amen? Now, I'm telling you right now, according to Jesus, there's a lot of people that are building a house on the ground without a foundation. They say they believe the Bible. Jesus said, if a man hears my word but doesn't do it, he said he's like a man who builds a house on the ground without a foundation. And when the storms and the winds come, they knock it down. Why do you think so many Christians are experiencing defeat in their life? When the storms and the tests and the trials and temptations of life come, it just blows them over. It knocks their marriage down. It destroys their finances, their physical health. Because they have built a house that has no foundation. But it's never too late. Never too late to make up your mind and say, you know what? Instead of sitting there that extra five minutes I got and reading Facebook, I'm just going to read the whole book of 1 John. It won't take long at all. Matter of fact, I read 1 John right before I walked out the door. And I take that back. I started in chapter 2 because there was something I was looking for. I started in chapter 2 and I read 1 John. It took take about five, ten minutes. I mean, you can read a whole book like Isaiah in a couple hours. Come on now. You want to build your faith? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Amen. You really want to build your faith? Read it out loud. Amen. Write it with the tongue. David said, your tongue's like the pen of a writer. Solomon said, write it upon the tables of your heart. With what? Your tongue. Read it out loud. Smith Wigglesworth said, read the Bible out loud. This is the man who raised 20-something from the dead. Come on, folks. Your faith can get stronger and stronger. Amen? So, now listen, I want you to rest, be rest assured now, okay, that if you'll do your part, God's going to do his part. Number nine. Number nine. Y'all got to pray for me to figure out how I'm going to do this thing <laughs> for two services. <laughs> Number nine. God gives us a choice of life or death, blessing or cursing. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. God says, I lay before you life and death. Listen, folks, it would be no difference right now if I just come down here and I had two laptops. I had a red one and a blue one. And I laid them up here and I said, I got a stack of reds, I got a stick of blue. You got a choice. Which one do you want, red or blue? God says, All right, here's life, here's death. Choose which one you want. He said, here's blessing, here's cursing. Which one you want? Choose. So that you, he said, now, here's the, the right answer. Choose life. That you and your children may live. How many really want to enjoy life? And see good days. Hallelujah. Then you've got to make the right choices with saying, I want the life of God. I want the blessings of God. Now, listen to me carefully. I want you all to get this, okay? The Bible says in Proverbs 26, 2, an undeserved curse never comes. An undeserved curse never comes comes when you make a choice whatever you choose folks you're choosing not just for yourself but you're also choosing for your children and your grandchildren yeah. to the third and fourth generation the bible says whatever you choose folks you're choosing for your children you're choosing for your grandchildren Amen. now listen to me carefully generational curses are tied to the choices that people make. Those choices can lead to sickness, divorce, poverty, destruction. A family can be marked by teen pregnancy, addictions, and all other terrible things. Okay? And where you find these, you find patterns of sin. Listen to me carefully. Where you find a family that is marked by divorce, teen pregnancy, alcoholism, drug addiction, poverty, and on and on it goes, you also find certain patterns of sin. And you can trace it back not only to their father, but to their grandfather, and sometimes even their great-grandfather. All right? 
I want everybody to understand, God doesn't punish children for the sins of their fathers. It's simply a fact that children so often repeat the sins of their fathers, thereby receiving the same curse. Did you know that's true? We call it cycles. Cycles of abuse. Cycles of alcoholism. Cycles of all kind of terrible things. All right? Let me show you something. 1 Kings 15, pull up verse 3. Now, in this chapter, it's talking about one of the kings whose name was Jeroboam. He was the son of Nebat. And the Bible says he walked in all the sins of his father, which he had done before him. His heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as the heart of David is his father, his forefather. See, he walked in the sins of his father. When a person walks in the sins of their father, the same curse that was upon the father or the grandfather comes upon them. That's the reason I want you to understand that generational blessings and generational curses are tied to the choices that we make today. When you make a bad choice today, you're not just making a bad choice for yourself. You're making it for your son and your daughter. You're making it for your grandson and your granddaughter. Listen to me. I came from a family who had made a lot of bad choices. Therefore, my family was marked by poverty and a lot of other things, cursing and fighting. But you know what? When I got saved and I discovered this in the Bible, we broke the generational curses off of our life and began generational blessings that have now passed to our children and now have passed to our grandchildren and are going to pass to our great-grandchildren. You know, I've got a, I have a, a, I started to say a niece, but she's not a, whatever she is, she's my sister's granddaughter. Anyway, she's my sister's granddaughter. And uh, the great niece, and uh, and I love them all. But one day in a conversation, you know this this woman's got several children of her own, and uh, one day you know I was there. She could tell I was very annoyed by the way her children acted, because it was out of control. And she said, "Well, Uncle Eddie." My children are not like Rebecca's children. They're just 110% boys. Now, she's making an excuse as to why her children don't act as good as Rebecca's children. Y'all can get mad if you want to. I don't care. I honestly do not care. I'm just telling you right now. When children are raised right, I'm not saying they can't go wrong because they have a free will. But I'm just telling you the choices, the chances of them living holy and godly are much greater when you live holy and godly. And you do it according to God's Word. And again, it's never too late. You say, well, I didn't get saved. My children are already grown and they're all messed up. Well, let them see your light shine. And begin to pray and plead the blood of Jesus over them. Be an example to them. Stand in the gap for them. Break the power of the devil off of them. Do everything you can with the love and the power of God to bring them into the family of God. Amen? This man, he walked in the sins of his fathers. Now, on the other hand, listen to me. When a man and woman does live a life of obedience to God, then the chances of their children living the same life, making the right choices, they're multiplied greatly. In Genesis 18, 19, God spoke of Abraham. He said, For I know that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. The blessing was upon Abraham. The blessing continued upon his son Isaac. The blessing continued upon his, his son Jacob. And the great-great-grandson, Joseph, was walking even greater blessing because of the generational blessing. I want you to listen. Genesis 49, 26. Put it up in the Amplified. In Genesis 49, 26, Jacob, now, who is the grandson of Abraham, said to his son Joseph before he died, The blessing of your father on you 
are greater than the blessings of my forefathers, Abraham and Isaac, on me. Think about that. The blessing of Abraham and the blessing of Isaac was upon Jacob. Now Jacob tells his son, Joseph, the blessings of your father, me, are greater than the blessings of my father and grandfather, Abraham and Isaac, that was upon me. Hallelujah. Boy, y'all got something to look forward to. Amen. Come on now. Amen. Don't tell me you can't raise godly children in this ungodly world. Amen. Because you can. It's all about the choices you make. You cannot lie in front of them and expect them not to lie. Amen. You cannot tell them to answer the phone and say, tell them I'm not here. And expect that they're going to live a life of truth. Come on now. You cannot sneak around and have pornography in your home and think that that boy is not going to find it. He will find it. You cannot live opposite of God's Word and think that your children are going to live holy. Because the first chance they get the boat, they're gone. Mm. Number 10. Here we go. Y'all ready? Drum roll, please. <laughs> Faith comes by hearing a certain sound. Faith comes by hearing a certain sound. You may be thinking right now, the only sound that I hear, the sound of my father and mother telling me I'll never amount to anything, I'm no good, the sound of a teacher telling me how dumb and stupid I was. You may be hearing the sound from the past of, of, of bullies that said you're ugly and you're fat and all that kind of stuff. But I'm telling you right now, you've got to put that stuff behind you. Amen? Amen. You've got to make up your mind, I'm never going to listen to that voice again. The Bible says there's many voices in this world, and none of them are without significance. Every one of them has a purpose. And a lot of those voices have a, nothing but a purpose but to destroy you, to create a poor self-image on the inside, to give you low self-esteem of yourself, to think lower of yourself than you ought to. Don't listen to those voices anymore. There's times when you've got to say, shut up in Jesus' name. You say, well, I don't I'll teach my children. Don't tell anybody's children to shut up but the devil. Okay? So I corrected that for y'all. All right? It's all right to tell the devil to shut up. Amen. Remind him, you're under my feet, devil. And that's the past. And this one thing I do, I forget that which is behind me. And now I am pressing for that which is before. God's got a plan for me. My future is bright. Amen? Hallelujah. I'm blessed to be a blessing. Glory to God. I'm telling you, faith comes by hearing a certain sound. In 1 Kings 18, verse 44, it was a time in the history of Israel where there had not been rain for three and a half years. There was nothing but dust everywhere. I mean, imagine this famine going on. Three and a half years, no rain? And Elijah challenged the false prophets of Baal. He defeated them. But then the Bible says he, look, look what happened. Back it up a little bit. No, that's it, that's it, I'm sorry. He said, behold, there rise a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. Go up, say they have... Prepare your chariot, get down, that the rain stop thee not. Now, listen, at the time that he said that, there was no rain. There were no clouds in the sky. It had not rained for three and a half years. There was no reason to believe that it was going to rain except that he'd heard from heaven. Now, back up a little bit. I think it's verse 41. Elijah said to Ahab, get up, eat and drink, for there's a sound. Everybody said there's a sound. There's a sound of abundance of rain. There's a sound of abundance of rain. He was hearing something in the Spirit. Are y'all listening to what I'm saying to you? He was hearing something in the Spirit. As a matter of fact, I believe somebody right now in this place or those watching online is hearing a sound in the Spirit of salvation. 
You've been looking for answers. You've been wanting to know, where can I find peace? Where can I get the joy that I need? How can I have what I see these happy Christians have? It's a sound of salvation. I've been to somebody here in a sound of healing. I've been hurting. I've been suffering. And I realize now that God loves me, that Jesus took my sickness and diseases. He made it possible for me to be healed. You're hearing a sound in the Spirit. There's people right now that are hearing the sound of deliverance. I don't have to stay bound. I don't have to be addicted any longer to cocaine, to meth, to alcohol, to cigarettes, to food, to pornography, or anything else. That's a sound. And if you will respond to that sound, I'm telling you the power of Almighty God will set you free. So anybody who wants to receive salvation, healing, deliverance, and anything from the Lord, come on right now. I'm going to ask my wife to come and join me. Come on, Tyler, come to the keyboard. Anybody, you want prayer, come line up right here. And while you're coming, I want you to begin to say it in your heart. Lord, I believe with hands laid on me, I will receive. Whatever it is, you fill in the blank. I'm going to receive it, Lord. I'm going to receive my salvation. I'm going to receive my healing. I'm going to receive my deliverance. I'm going to receive peace. I'm going to receive the joy of the Lord. I'm believing, Lord, you're going to fix my marriage. I'm going to receive financial blessings, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Everybody shake your hands out. I want you all to join your faith with us. I want you to say it out loud. We agree that with hands are laid on these, that the anointing will destroy every yoke, and they will receive what they believe for now in Jesus' name. There it is right there. The anointing. The anointing. Oh, the anointing of Almighty God is in this place. I plead the blood of Jesus over her and her family right now in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. The name of Jesus. The powers in the name of Jesus released into you right now. The name, the name of Jesus. That name above every name is released unto you right now. The anointing destroys every yoke. The anointing, be free, receive, heal, whole in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. In the name. Lord, thank you. As I lay my hands, as we lay, that's the anointing, the anointing to heal, to deliver, to set free in Jesus' name. Glory to God, glory to God. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. We praise you, Lord. We worship you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see right now. It's yours. Take it. Take it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, thank you, Father God. That everything that's in that name of Jesus right now, the power that's in Jesus that's in that name, and it's released to my brother and my sister, and they believe they receive, we agree with them, and it is done in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We worship you. I thank you, Father God. It's never too late. When people believe, it's never too late. You raised Lazarus from the dead after four days. It's never too late for resurrection power. In the name of Jesus, right now receive. Thank you, Father God. Hallelujah. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, sometimes it takes longer. I hear the Spirit of God saying, sometimes it takes longer to turn some things around than it does other things. Some things that have been set in motion, it takes longer. You can turn that horse around very quickly, but that ship in the storm takes a little bit longer. But yet it's not impossible. You're headed in the right direction, I hear the Spirit of God say. Keep pointing your tongue in that direction and watch my power bring correction in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord, in the name. Right now, I break the power of it off of your life in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. The anointing right now is there to set free, to heal, to deliver, to bless in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You know, there may be somebody here or someone watching that's been born again. And right now, I want to give you that opportunity because you hear that sound of salvation. You hear the Holy Spirit calling you, drawing you, wooing you, pulling you to the, to the Lord Jesus Christ. All you got to do is believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, 
And right then, you'll receive forgiveness of sins. The blood of Jesus will cleanse you. You'll receive eternal life imparted to your spirit. Everybody pray together. Lord God, I do believe that you gave your son Jesus to die for my sins and the sins of this world. I believe with my heart that he rose from the dead, that he is alive. So I confess with my mouth, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. I believe, I receive, by grace through faith, your salvation. I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. The Lord is good. Amen. We love you.